Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. I'm here with Stephanie LaFlora. Welcome, Stephanie. Hello. Thanks for having me. So Stephanie is from Denver, Colorado, and she's CEO of Crown Hunt and Moxie.ai. We'll go into that later. She's a creative entrepreneur who's very passionate about the art of storytelling. So today we're going to look at why stories are so important for entrepreneurs, what kind of stories need to be told, and of course, how to tell them. Stephanie recently created a group called Founder Fam, which is for entrepreneurs who want to enjoy the journey. And so we'll be talking a little bit about her inspiration for that as well. And great to have you here with us, Stephanie. Hi, thank you. I'm excited for this conversation. Amazing. Me too. So, Stephanie, before we do get into it, tell us a bit about you personally. What, what What's your kind of background and your story and how did you come to be so passionate about storytelling? Yeah, well, storytelling for me really, it began a long time ago. I was entering authors competitions as a kid. I uh, wrote my first screenplay at 13. Like I was just always a really passionate storyteller. I feel like I was born a storyteller. So that was always core. Entrepreneurship, I think, is something that actually came out of that through a natural evolution. I really wanted to be in control of the creative work that I did. And as I would in was working and building my career, I noticed that like so much of the power was outside of the hands of creatives. And so that made me really curious about the business end of things and understanding how you can create something that has value, but also produces revenue. And so that I, I kind of evolved into an entrepreneurial career from creative roots. So, so yeah, it really was a natural evolution for me. Yeah. And I think it's very important for creatives to have that entrepreneurial streak. We need it, don't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, because, you know, it's every, I feel like there's a creator's struggle that is common. Everyone experiences it. And it's when you want to create something that you have strong vision for, but you got to get the economics together. Mm -hmm. And so being able to figure out the business side of things really just enables you to create bigger things and to imagine more nuanced ideas and actually bring them to life. Oh, definitely. And it also enables us, well, as you said, to just, you know, continue doing what we do best, really. And who doesn't want to do that, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about your businesses as well, Stephanie. You've got two businesses, right? Yeah. And one really led into the other. I feel like my entire life has been like a really natural evolution, just paying attention to what's inside. So I, my background is actually in tech. Even though I started as a creative and I st actually began in publishing, but I, as m my career went on, I ended up in the tech world. I was very curious about it. And why, when I moved to Denver, because I'm originally from Chicago, I couldn't find anybody to style my hair. And ah. I, up until that point, I never noticed that getting your hair styled finding a stylist was always this word of mouth experience. I also mm -hmm. didn't notice how culturally segregated getting your hairstyle was. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved to Colorado and I worked in Boulder, which has less than 1% black people. And I was the first black employee at my tech company. Mm -hmm. I realized that like not having someone who was black to ask, where do you get your hairstyle meant that I didn't know where to go. And mm -hmm. so I that can sound odd or strange maybe to some people who never considered it, but think next time you go to get your hairstyle, look mm -hmm. around and see how homogenous the room is. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it's not just because of neighborhood. It's actually because of skill. And that's what I discovered. So mm -hmm. I made appointments around me at, you know, just the salons that were nearby. And when I arrived, they looked at my hair in the lobby. I had an appointment and they were like, I'm sorry, <laughs> but we cannot style your hair. And I learned that that was because of cosmetology school, not actually training people how to style curly and coily hair. Mm -hmm. And so with my background in tech at that point, you know, just really figuring out how to solve problems in different industries with technology. Mm. I saw that immediately as this big opportunity. So that's what led to me creating Crown Hunt because I was on the hunt for my own crown. Yeah. And we started off educating hairstylists on how to style curly and coily hair, partnering with the leading uh, curl experts in the industry. 
And now we're evolving into actually serving consumers and helping them find the resources that they're looking for with hair. So that was like the beginning of things. And um, in that process of being a new entrepreneur and being in accelerators and raising funds and being around other entrepreneurs in that space, I realized how power, even how powerful storytelling really was Mm. because I had this advantage as an early founder of being able to tell the story of the company really well in a way that would get press that, and I wasn't pursuing these things, these were happening. And that's when I realized like, oh, this is really powerful, even beyond what I thought. And so I created Moxie AI to really help other founders tell their stories just as well so they can get funding so that they can attract the right audience and stop the scroll. Oh, that's really, really fantastic. And you just told your own story really well there, Stephanie. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much for that. That sounds sounds great. So let, let's get on to this topic of storytelling. So, well, first of all, why are stories so important for entrepreneurs? I think stories are important for everyone because they create readiness. I grew up in the church and there's a scripture actually in the Bible and I don't quote scripture all the time, but I just think this is a very relevant point that says this Jesus, you know, Jesus is doing this thing. He's always talking in kind of parables and things and it frustrated the disciples. And so the disciples were frustrated. Like, why are you always talking in these parables? Like just basically get to the point. And the like totally non-religious version of this story that I like to tell, like just to see the other side of it is like, going to a therapist or having a coach. They Mm -hmm. never tell you direct answers. They never tell you, this is what I think you should do next. They're always asking you questions, you know, Socrates, same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they were so frustrated with this and this Bible story. And his response was, I tell stories to create readiness. And Mm -hmm. I just think that's universally true. Like Mm -hmm. regardless of your faith, that's not even the point. Mm -hmm. It's just that that's what stories really do. And so if you have a product or a service, you're creating Mm -hmm. readiness in others to receive what they've been looking for in your, in your service or in your product. And like in a really empathetic way, like that's a way of, of explaining why stories matter. Mm, I just love that so much, actually. That's a really refreshing way of looking at it. And I have to say that I have never thought about stories in that way before. But I guess in a way, it's bypassing that whole sales process because we grow, we grew up with stories, didn't we? Mm-hmm. And stories have been around forever. And Parents tell their children stories from when they're really tiny and stories help us make sense of the world, don't they? Mm -hmm. And that's always been their job. I mean, I remember even when I was uh, studying Greek literature and the Greek myths and so on, when people knew nothing about the world, but they Mm -hmm. had to come up with reasons as to why the the weather was a certain way or why seasons happened or why the a crop failed or something like and it was all stories because otherwise people would just be left with this feeling of just not knowing so i think i think that is you know i just love the way that you describe that in terms of uh, readiness it's a very simple concept but really nice i love that <laughs> yeah i mean i that's from the bible that's not really from me but i oh, think uh, i just think it's just anyway so- hey? <laughs> I just think it's so beautiful. Like it just makes sense to me. And it's what we do, right? We watch these, even when you're growing up and you're, you're a kid, you're watching these stories of people fall in love and that makes you feel ready to fall in love yourself. Like it's very human. It's very human. Yeah, true, true. Because in a way it sort of gives you permission to go there, doesn't it? Because it's saying, it's saying, look, there you are. This is, this can be done. I guess yes. that's it really, isn't it? Well, because once you imagine something, it can be true. Yes. Like yeah. that creates the opportunity for it to become mm. real, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. And so I think that's what it is in like a really empathetic way. And it's a different way of looking at it because it's mm. especially right now, you know, I think social media, email marketing, everything is just like, rah, like, it's just like really mm-hmm. overwhelming. Even as a person who loves to consume stories, I'm like, whoa, we have like really reached a, a critical like peak moment in content yeah. creation and consumption. So it's like, how in the world is it possible for you to make anything that someone can connect with, with that much noise? And mm-hmm. I think that that's what it is. You're not looking for 
And this is really an aha that I've been having recently. Mm-hmm. Is it's not that you're just looking for who anyone I want all the followers, like that just actually really does not matter. It's about the people who are really looking for what you have, like they already need it. Mm. It's about reaching them. So it's not really convincing people. Mm. It's really being clear enough in articulating the problem you're solving, who you're solving it for, that people mm. are like, oh, that's my exit over there. Yeah, yeah. So it's obvious. It's not forced at all. It's like very yeah. gentle, actually. And I'm learning that, you know, because mm. I think even as a marketer and a storyteller, we we copy sometimes what we see. We feel like we have to make sure we do what everybody else is doing, or top three tips or whatever, you know, all the all the things that we prescribe to they're just temporary. Like Mm. those tactics work for a very short amount of time until everybody does it. And it's exhausting. And then that somebody with influence tries something else and it works. And then everybody runs over there to do that. But like at the end of the day, this is human. And I think, I think it's really easy to forget that. And if you can, and the readiness helps you remember, I think the human element of why someone says yes or clicks or buys. Mm. Yeah, yeah, really, really good point. So let's get into the the how. So how does somebody tell a story? And where what, what's the entry point? I think you always start with the hook. <laughs> and it's hard to do that you have to like from in terms of the creative process. It's, it's, it can be really hard to do that, even as a creative, mm. you just have to have certain rules that you create. Mm -hmm. for what you create because when you're in the moment you might forget some of those tactics that just plain work and starting with the hook is one of those things you know if you're going to tell the story of why your product is great or whatever you want to start with like the crescendo moment think about the opening scene of a movie yeah there there, the person's running down the street already you don't even know why they're running down the street but now you want to know and so you stick around to find out that's how you have to create that's what scroll stopping looks like when, yeah. when I must know what's in the next frame. Yeah, that that's funny because when I used to, I, I I used to work with my children on on writing stories, and and of course it's always a children's instinct to say, I was walking down the street one day, and it was quite a nice day, and I saw somebody that I liked, and I said hello to. It's like, no, you know, you've got to start at that point where you're drowning in the sea and you've got shipwrecked, and <laughs> and you know something awful is happening, you're just about to get eaten by a shark or whatever it is, because that grabs their attention doesn't it so I mean in terms of the hook for people who aren't really familiar let's just say with with the whole term of like having a hook how would you describe it then in terms of in terms of you know what entrepreneurs have to do I think that another word for hook would be punchline Mm. so I think a lot of people can relate to that you you start with the punchline so Mm -hmm. you know if You know, you might, if it's a video, especially if there's a visual, I'm working with a company right now that is essentially like decentralizing the way that Uber and Instacart are used. So instead of it being specifically for picking up my groceries or specifically for taking me to the airport, it's just like cars and people with cars and people who need things done, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. So if you're doing an ad, you might actually start the ad with a cat in the backseat. You're not going to start where the person's taking the animal Mm -hmm. and and what's actually happening in this scene is that their cat is being taken to the vet by this person who was able to do that while they're busy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like there's, you start Mm -hmm. with that in the middle of the action where you're trying to draw out curiosity. Yep. That's like the objective. And again, these things are not easy to do. That's Mm -hmm. why (laughs) you need process. Because if you don't have the process, especially with how much content we have to create these days, Mm -hmm. you'll just forget it. And I do that too sometimes. So this is a good reminder for me as well. But that's really, uh, I think, starting with the punchline, starting with the moment, the 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 action, the the relief, even Mm. or maybe the problem. Actually, the problem. Now that I'm talking, you're starting with that moment where whatever that is a catastrophe in their life that you saw, they're in the middle of that right now. Like that's all happening right now. Yeah, and then 
and then the relief, you know. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing thing is, I, I mean, look, we we humans love to be entertained, don't we? We we we're just entertainment driven missiles in a way, aren't we? And so. <laughs> So unfortunately, if you don't entertain, I come from the media and entertainment industry. That was where where I grew up in big advertising agencies and television companies and so on. So I understand stand this quite well, that if we if we are boring, people will just disengage. Right. So. So it's really the interesting thing about what you're saying is it's really about engaging emotion, isn't it? It's about mm-hmm. that kind of like <gasps> that that feeling or that kind of like ah, you know, or that it's that feeling, isn't it, that we're 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 trying to get to, isn't it? It is, and it's and it has to be relatable, and that's why influencers have been able to create an industry in a very very busy industry where there's a lot of red tape. I mean, advertising, like, please, who would think that millions of just random, normal people, very talented people, Mm -hmm. but not necessarily initially influential people could disrupt the advertising industry? Like, that is very hard to do. But it's because of how relatable they were. They were bringing in a different level of human connection that Mm -hmm. brands just weren't perceptive enough to to do because their objectives were different you know yeah yeah that's a very interesting way way of looking at it and you know I've got three daughters who they follow these influencers and there's this one I mean she's quite a famous influencer but my daughter is always watching her on on her phone while she's cooking it's like oh you know this like your best friend again you know and and she's like no it's not my best friend it's Molly May <laughs> like, okay okay but you know I, it's it to me, you know, to somebody of my age, it just sounds like, oh, they're just talking on and on and on and on. But can you imagine talking on and on and on like that in a way that actually manages to captivate, you know, somebody of my daughter's age? It, it has a lot of skill that goes into that, right? A lot of talent. And like, Jane, it's authentic. That's the that's the hardest thing for a lot of brands because mm. the game has changed. Yeah. Like how you tell the story has changed before. Mm. So pre, I don't know, maybe pre 2010, mm-hmm. let's just say the story that was being told is, don't you want to be like this? It was all, I'm aspiring to be something I'm not. And if you can create an ideal, whatever that ideal is, it's a lot of versions of that, but if yeah. you can create an ideal, that I want to be like, and that I'll, I'll crave, you can get me to buy something. Well, Mm -hmm. that's changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Now it's, if you can show me a mirror where I feel like I, me, the real me exists and is out there and I'm not alone, then I'll buy it. That is such an, uh, uh, those are opposing like perspectives. Very different. Right. So brands are struggling because they have always done that way. And that's fundamentally different than this other approach. And honestly, you kind of got to believe it. It's hard to create marketing and branding and tell stories where you're telling people that they are accepted if you haven't accepted yourself. So the truth is, how to? I mean, I like to go psychological with it because I think all of it is. I think to create a strong, compelling story, your ingredients must include authenticity. And in order to do that, you have to say the things that people are afraid to say, but not for shock, not for, I mean, people do that and it can work, but in the best storytellers, not for shock, not for just disruption, but because you really believe it. And every brand, every culture, every influencer, every individual has some belief that they really believe in from their through true authentic place that isn't necessarily popular opinion. And that's a great place to start. It's scary, but it's a great place to start because now all of a sudden when you're talking about that noisy room, you're the only one that's lit up because nobody's saying that. And if there's 200 people, 200 potential clients that are looking for someone who gets them like that, you'll probably be okay with 200. And then those 200 will tell the other people they know that also fit in that group. And then that's how you find your core audience, you know? And it's just hard as hell to do that because especially as startup founders, we're chasing like impossible numbers and impossible timelines. So you just don't feel, that's too scary. 
you know, Mm. to take that kind Mm. of a risk when you got 12 months or you're out of funding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of in terms of your story, Stephanie, what what's something that you would say that is not necessarily, you know, popular opinion or not not vanilla? So what 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 are you courageous about? Yeah, I love that question. I love that question. I just recorded a video right before this, actually, and it started with I'm not afraid. And I started listing this. So this is a great timing. Mm-hmm. I am not afraid to be vulnerable. I'm not afraid to be wrong and then fix it in public. I'm also not afraid to say that raising money as a founder sucks. And Mm -hmm. even though I was fortunate enough in 2022 to be one of about 100 female founders, Black female founders to get venture funding, Mm -hmm. it still sucks. Like even if you figure it out. And so I believe this is my opinion and everybody's truth will be different for them. But I believe that looking into other alternatives other than raising money with ventures and stuff like that is is the way to go. Because the amount of energy that it takes to raise money, time, hours, stress, Mm -hmm. just focus on that versus your business, all that stuff. The amount of energy that it takes, you could literally create another business Mm -hmm. that will be sustainable. That would help you fund what you're doing. (laughs) so I just and that's just one idea but like there's so many you know like people have amazing skills and talents and all this stuff and it's like maybe you tap into that other part of you that that has been on the shelf that actually could make money and you do that to raise funds I just think that bootstrapping and uh, non-dilutive funds are an extremely powerful way to raise money you don't always have as much money but you have clarity in your brain Mm. which is invaluable (laughs) and the thing is you're you're talking from a place of experience because having actually been through that process if you were talking about ah you know don't raise funds and uh, just bootstrap your business and you'd never actually raised funds or you'd never experienced bootstrapping your business as well as raising funds then you wouldn't be credible really would you so the fact that you have actually done both of those things that's where the authenticity comes in right yeah I think so and I think that it really comes back to it's really for creative entrepreneurs the people Mm -hmm. who they got into entrepreneurship because they wanted to express some part of them Mm -hmm. and it's more than just an economic plan it's a little bit of a soul plan and I think that when that's the case, venture funding is kind of in opposition to that. It's not that venture funding is bad. It's just that if your goal is that venture funding is going to really like rub, rub that the wrong way. <laughs> like it's just it's just in friction. There's a lot of friction that you'll have mm-hmm. naturally from those two decisions being made at the same time. And so yeah. I think it's for everyone to evaluate what's for them. But as I experienced that I felt that and I've been processing Mm. that a lot and trying to put words to it because, again, Mm. I can't be the only one that feels this way. And so whoever those other folks are, you know, I'm here, too. So that's something I think about. Yeah, (laughs) that's very interesting because I I actually scaled and sold a brand identity business to a U.S. communications group. So this was I've been through, you know, not not Osley wasn't similar because it wasn't we weren't raising venture capital. We were basically selling a a business that, that had grown. But obviously, with a brand identity business, I mean, it's full of creatives. Of course it is. You know, it's a creatively led business. And so there was a lot of designers in that business. And when we were acquired by this U.S. group, it was really, well, it was an, it was a communications group. So they did have a lot of agencies in there. But it became, it was very, very money led. It was really all about the money. And so I experienced that at first hand. And I know exactly what you're talking about, because to be honest, the agendas are different, aren't they? And they they are. And even in a neutral way, like even if you don't want to judge either side, Mm. it's not about that. It's just like really about getting clear on what you actually want, because entrepreneurship is excruciating. Mm. People don't talk about it. It's excruciating if you're winning. It's excruciating if you're losing. It just has (laughs) that factor in it, you know, and I'm not saying it is every day, all day, but there are certain levels of fear that you probably Mm. wouldn't feel if you took a traditional route, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you're you're exposing yourself to that. 
for what? It better be a good reason. So yes. for some people, that thing is, I'm going to be a multimillionaire and that is the thing. And if that's how you're dream- great, fantastic. That's wonderful. Live that, live that truth. But yes. if that's not the thing that does it for you, if you need to be like, I want to be able to create whatever I want, or I have this very specific vision of how I want to change something in the world, whatever oh, that yeah. thing is, protect it. Cause that's the only thing, that's the only reason to pursue this very treacherous path. So oh. if you abandon that, then you're just lost. And oh, so yeah. I like to, I really just like to encourage entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs to figure out what that thing is that they must protect Mm. so that they can build businesses around that and not go, you know, five years into the future, doing, building something you didn't even want, you know, that's just, let's not do that. Yeah. I love that. You know, you, you definitely communicate with such clarity and uh, it just makes so much sense. So, so tell us about, about the community that you've created, Stephanie, love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, we actually just kicked it off. It's called Founders Fam. Mm -hmm. And really it's a community of entrepreneurs, mostly startup founders, tech founders, but it's open to any entrepreneur, small business owners who are really interested in enjoying the journey. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big part of it for me. So what I was just talking about, about figuring out like, what is that thing you must protect and create it around that? Mm -hmm. Um, It's a big focus. Um, There's also a big focus on um, marketing and brand because that's my background and I want to share what I have um, with the group Um, and just getting together. It's a very diverse group from all over the country, could be all over the world. And you can join that on our Instagram. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, Yeah, well, that sounds really exciting. So Stephanie, what what is what is your plans for the for the rest of this year, let's say, because, you know, as we record this, we're at the beginning of 2024. So, you know, what what's on the cards for you personally? Yeah, I mean, my focus this year is really all about community. One of the greatest and really honestly a tough lesson that I learned as an early tech startup founder was how valuable community is. And I did not pay as much attention to that because I was trying to make sure the product worked and I was trying to make sure we had distribution channels and things like that. And there's only so many people. And so my lesson that I'm trying to share with everybody else is Mm. that if you skip building community, when you launch, you will not be in the space that your product deserves. Yeah. That your story deserves. It could be all excellent, but because you haven't built this community that's excited about what you are bringing out and also that you've built trust and relationship with, you will not be able to do what you're trying to do. And Mm so I'm building, I'm correcting that mistake and I'm building community now And I'm inviting people to uh, build community with me as well. So as I learn how to build community, I'm sharing what I'm learning with other people who are also trying to build their own unique communities for their businesses. And so that's really my focus. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. And okay, so I mean, if somebody was was to say, okay, I I I get this. I'm I'm launching a product. In fact, my daughter's launching it, launching a a lingerie product, which is a sustainable. I mean, I won't go on about it because she'd probably say, don't talk about that. <laughs> but anyway, so this issue of community, so building a tribe around what you do, is very important. So where would people start to do that? How would they do it, Stephanie? I think the first thing is go find adjacent communities. Because they're already out there, whatever your industry is, whatever the problem you're solving. And the way you know if it's the right, when I say adjacent, is Mm. if their audience is the same audience that would be interested in your product. Okay. So find other communities like that because they're already attracting people that are, would be your customers as well. So you need to go in there and see how are they doing that? How do they talk to each other? What is, you know, what's working? Like go be a student would be my first uh, and that's what I'm doing right now. So I would say, go be a student and then start somewhere. It doesn't matter if your community has two or three people. If y'all are serious about helping each other, that two or three people will grow to six people, will grow to nine people. And it doesn't matter where you start. Do not despise small beginnings. I always say that is so true. And just don't. 
And so start there and then it'll grow. And you could do that by creating like a discord. That's what I did. And then I also just created a broadcast channel on Instagram literally today. And people are already in there and we're talking about how to raise funds. Wow. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. So, so thank you so much for sharing that, Stephanie. It's been, I have to say, such an inspirational interview. I really have enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you so much. And if people want to get hold of you or they want to find out more about your businesses and your community and so on, where, where's the best place for them to, for them to, to find you? Yeah, absolutely. You can uh, follow me on Instagram at Stephanie LaFlora. And my branding company, Moxie AI, is also on Instagram. You can find the communities and everything you're looking for there as well. And if you're a business that's looking to brand or rebrand this year, give us a call. We're at MoxieAIBrands.com. Well, you know, it's just been such a pleasure. I really have enjoyed our conversation today, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. uh, Yeah, look forward to, uh, you know, following your progress and keeping in touch. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. This has been a blast.